What is up everyone, Nick here, and in this video we're going to cover how to paint your cosplay props and also how to do the final installation of your motorization kit for your Iron Man helmet. This is the final part in a series where I show you guys how to make your very own Iron Man helmet with the opening and closing faceplate. So if you're not caught up already, I highly recommend you go check out those other videos on my channel. We cover how to scale, 3D print, sand, do the electronics and coating, and in this video of course we're going to be doing the paint and the final installation of the electronics. So before we go into the shop I would just like to give you guys some advice before you start painting stuff on what you should do to get ready. Number one, test your paints. Not all paints like to be painted the same way and not all paints react well to other types of paints. For example, these pieces I made for my Tony Stark cosplay use three different paints. So it was really crucial that I test these paints out before I start masking stuff off and painting paints over other paints. Because let me tell you, there is nothing that sucks more than having your paint bubble and react weird and do all sorts of funky stuff and just come out bad. So that's why you should go to the store and buy yourselves these. These are literally just plastic spoons. So you would sand it just like you would with your regular parts and then you'd paint it and then let it dry and then try testing out your other paints over that paint. And once it's dry and there's no weird reactions with your paints, then congratulations, your paints work together. Now, another thing I would like to highlight here is when you're painting, please follow the instructions on the can. Now you might be thinking, Nick, are you stupid? Of course, we're gonna follow the instructions on the camp. But listen to me, okay? I have screwed up too many paint jobs because I wasn't paying attention and didn't read the instructions because not all paints are made the same. So, before you start spraying, just reread the can real quick, make sure everything's good, and then you're on your merry way. So with that said, I think we're ready to start painting, so let's cut to Pasnik and get to work. Alrighty, so I have all my parts laid out here in the shop. Um, one thing I will be doing before I start painting is using a tack rack. So basically, this is just a very tacky rag. You can get this at most auto shops like Napa. Basically, these are used to wipe down the surfaces of whatever parts you're painting before you actually paint them. So this gets rid of dust or any debris that might have built up on the part. Here's my rag. Just gonna wipe away any sort of dust that might be on the surface, just like that. So now that this is super nice, super clean, it's finally ready for paint. So we're gonna go into the booth and I'm gonna show you my spray painting techniques. Also, don't forget, safety first. So I have my respirator here around my neck. I also have a pair of goggles to protect my eyes and I have this latex glove. And basically, I'm gonna put this on my non-dominant hand. That way I can manipulate the part and paint with the other one and I don't get any overspray on my hand. So with that said, let's go in the booth. Now, before I do any sort of painting with rattle cans, I always make sure to reread the instructions on the can because not all paints are made the same. For example, with Duplicolor Perfect Match paints, they recommend that you shake the can for one full minute before using it and then 10 seconds for each minute of use. And they also recommend two to three light coats to prevent any sort of sagging with this paint. Now I've used this type of paint in the past and I found that it always takes at least three coats for the paint to be properly applied to the part. Anything under three coats with this type of paint always ends up looking not quite done, if that makes any sense. Like it doesn't have the exact color it should have. So if you have to apply more than one coat afterwards, okay, it is what it is. At least you're not ruining your paint job with sagging and running paint. What we're going to do just like the can says, we're gonna do sweeping motions. So when I paint my cosplay parts, I always make sure to do the corners and edges that are hard to reach. I just prefer this because instead of doing the surfaces and then doing the edges and getting a bunch of overspray on top of the nice paint, it's the other way around. So your paint is going over the overspray. And it's always good practice to spray before you start making contact with your surface. So instead of spraying here and starting to make your way to the edge, you wanna start on the outside of your part, Make your way down here, and then once you're off your part, you release the button. Voila. And that's one edge done for now. We don't want to go too heavy with it. We're doing light coats. Let's do the other side. Voila. And then the top here. There's a fly in my booth. So as you can probably see, there is a little bit of overspray, but that's okay because we're going to be spraying over this now. Can right here. Oh my lord. Voila. And there you have it. That's our first coat for the handguard. It's very, very thin. We can still see the primer. 
but that's okay because we want to be doing light coats with this. So we're going to apply two, maybe even three more coats after this to make sure we have perfect coverage over everything. So let's move on to the rest of the parts. So again, I'm starting with my edges, just like so. And then I can actually start working on the surface itself. Beautiful. Wonderful. So we're now day two in the painting process itself. I've actually done quite a bit of painting in the meantime. So I painted all the parts in this champagne gold and as you'll notice, it's a little foggy. The paint didn't come out quite right, but that's okay because as soon as we clear coat this, all of this foggy paint is just gonna stabilize and it's gonna look completely normal. Now, how do I know this? Well, I did testing. So these are the exact same paints. When I originally painted this spoon, it was very, very foggy and then I added the clear coat over it and it completely dissipated and it looks perfectly fine now. So crisis averted, our parts are gonna be completely fine once we clear coat them. Speaking of which, I've already clear coated some parts. Here we have the hand, this came out really, really good. So I've already painted all the parts that are going to be red and don't need any sort of masking. I still need to clear coat the vast majority of them, but before we do that, we're going to talk about masking. Case in point, this calf piece, if I'm not mistaken, the whole rear part of the calf is going to be red, so we're going to be masking this with yellow frog tape. This frog tape right here masks very well. It doesn't leave a sticky residue behind, so we're going to be using this for the vast majority of our masking. And we're also going to be using this brown packing paper. So basically, instead of wasting a bunch of tape trying to tape off huge surfaces, we're going to tape off the edges that need to be covered, and then we're gonna use this brown packing paper to cover those large surfaces. So I've already taped off the shin. Basically what I do is I follow all of the straight lines with my tape. So I'll take a piece of tape. Oh my Lord, this is falling over. Rip it off, toss this to the side. Ah. And essentially I will line it up with whatever edge is straight, just like this. So if you have any circular edges like this, they're absolutely terrible to mask off, but basically what you wanna do is use tiny increments of tape at a time so you really get that smooth transition of the curve or else you're gonna have jagged edges, it's gonna bleed through, and you're gonna have a really wonky seam line right here. And once I've masked off all the edges that I want, that's when I start using the tape a little bit more liberally. I start covering up all the holes and seams and whatnot. And that's when I grab my packing paper, rip a huge chunk out of it, add a huge strip of tape to it, glue it to one side and start wrapping it around to the other side, maybe even folding it into the part, that way there's no bleed on the inside. And yeah, this is basically ready for paint. And once I painted all the red areas, I removed all the masking tape and all the paper and I let it sit for about a day. Now it's not supposed to take that long to cure, I just wanted to be absolutely sure that the paint was dry before moving on. And then I masked off all the areas that I wanted to paint chrome, painted it a flat black, and then added a gloss clear coat over that. And then I finally added the Duralumin Tough for that chrome finish. Again, removed all the masking tape, let that sit for a little bit, and then I drenched everything in 2K clear coat. Usually I stick to Duplicolor 1K because it has such a long pot life in the can, but since I had so many parts to clear coat, I decided to go with the Spray Max 2K clear coat. Now the Spray Max 2K is only meant to last about two days once you've activated both parts. But since I had so many parts, I knew that that 2K was not gonna go to waste, and of course I emptied that can. Now that everything is dry, we're finally back inside, and now we finally start assembling stuff. Now I've already started assembling some of this because this video is supposed to focus just on the Mark 42 helmet, but for example, the shin here, I added some padding on the inside, that way it would sit right on my leg. And I also started assembling the boot. So basically there's two elastics on either side of the toe and there's a hinge here guiding it. So whenever I'm walking, I can bend my toe. If you're curious on how I built this, I'm using the exact same mechanics on my Mark 46 boots and you can go check that out in part one of that video. I'll probably leave a link here. And besides the shoe, I also assembled the forearm and the glove. So the forearm has that little inner detail right there. I also added some padding on the inside and the glove, it's really nothing complicated. All the digits have been glued to an 
elastic that glues to the hand. That way they all dangle just like that. And I also added a hinge and an elastic to the handguard. That way, whenever I am posing with the glove, if I can put it on, there we go. So whenever I'm posing with the glove, the handguard's not gonna get caught. It's just going to lift like that. It's not the most elegant solution since there's a hole right here, but front facing, it's absolutely perfect. But with that said, I'm gonna move all of this aside and we're gonna focus on assembling the helmet. So the first step we're gonna take with assembling this helmet is gluing some of these little detail pieces into their place. Now we're not gonna glue them permanently though. We're only going to be using the bare minimum when it comes to glue in case that something is misaligned when we're motorizing it, we can still take it apart without ruining any of the paint. And once it's finalized and everything is working, then we can start gluing things permanently and we can also start using a soldering iron to weld some of these parts together. That way they don't ever break off. So let me move this aside. I'm gonna start with the eyes because they're by far some of the easiest parts to glue in place. And this is going to be particularly easy because Walsh 3D designs slots for most of the detail parts. For example, if you look at the eyes, you can see that there's a clear ridge there, which is meant to perfectly align the detail piece for the inside of the eye, just like that. So there's no guesswork here. We just have to add a little bit of glue and set it in place and it's going to be perfectly aligned. We're just gonna add the teeniest amount along this ridge right here. Then we're gonna grab the eye and just smush it in there. Beautiful. Okay, so next up, we're gonna need to glue this lip right in there. Again, just the tiniest amount of glue will do for this. Be a little bit of glue right there, just to be sure. You might be able to see right here, there's some slots that are made specifically for these little detail pieces. So I'm gonna flip this upside down, add a little bit of glue in here. Aww. There you have it. Now, all we have to do are these uh, ears. Gangster. There you have it. All the parts that we needed to glue in place have been glued in place. Throw the faceplate right there. Oh, this looks good. Okie dokie. And now the moment that you've all been waiting for, it's finally time to motorize the faceplate. So let me give you a quick breakdown of what's going on inside the faceplate and how the mechanism actually works. So first off, you have these two helper arms. These are gonna be on the sides of the helmet and they're going to help the servo arms guide the faceplate up and turn around onto the top of the helmet. And of course, each helmet is made a little bit differently. Some 3D files don't have any motorization inside their helmet, but some designers like Walsh 3D, Levy 3D, etc., they design the motorization built into the helmet. So in the case of Walsh's Mark 42, there are two little pivots on each side of the cheeks. Those are where the helper arms are going to mount and pivot. And next up, we have the actual main servo assembly itself. So this is made, this is made out of quite a few parts, so let me break it down for you. First off, we have the main servo mount right here. So you have the two Tower Pro MG90S servos right here. And as you can see, they're screwed in using the screws that are included with the MG90 servos. And this whole block right here is going to mount inside the Widow's Peak here. And then farther below, we have the actual main driving arms that lead down here. On either side, you have these tiny servo horn arms that are built into the actual part. And then down below, you have this mounting point. This is going to mount to the faceplate and it's going to pivot like so. And as you can probably tell, there are screws on each side with washers that screw into this block because this also needs to pivot. So that covers pretty much all the parts needed for the motorization. Now we can finally start assembling it. So the very first thing you need to do is sand all of these pivoting points. So that includes the helper arms, the servo driving arms, this little mount piece, and the pivots that are built into the helmet if you have any. And the reason why is because when you're 3D printing, you don't always have the best tolerances. So to make sure that things are moving nice and smoothly and aren't staying stuck, we need to sand them with sandpaper and with files. So I've already gone ahead and done that for the inside of these helper arms. So now they're moving nice and smooth, just like so. And once all your parts are moving smoothly, the very first thing you're going to be installing are the helper arms, because since you have the pivots already built into your helmet, that is a fixed point. You can't adjust it after you've installed the rest of it. There is a little bit of wiggle room, so if we install this first, we might not be able to install our helper arms afterwards. So we're gonna start with the helper arms and move on to this. So right now I'm using hex button M3 screws, so, 
Let's drive one through the washer. There we go. Voila. So that's two hinges bolted in. Now we can bolt this into the helmet. Eek. Okay, so uh, the helper arms have been installed. Uh, that was a terrible experience, but I pulled it off anyways. Now we finally have to install this doodad. So not entirely sure how I'm gonna go about this. So we're gonna just figure it out as we go. Also, one thing I absolutely love is Walsh 3D, whenever he uploads a new helmet, he makes an Instagram post about it. And in his Instagram posts, his photos are super, super detailed, highly, highly valuable when you're building one of these. Because right now I'm looking at a render of his faceplate and that's giving me an idea of where this has to glue in the faceplate. So it's like right above where the details are. Okie dokie, that's glued in place. So you can probably tell, but I decided to use a different motorization kit. This isn't the stock one that's included with the Mark 42 files. I went ahead and printed out the customizable motorization kit that Walsh 3D made. A few things to keep in mind when you're installing the servo mounts is whenever you're gluing it in place, when you're testing it out, you wanna make sure that there's no friction when the mask lifts up and when it comes down. If it stays stuck at the widow's peak, you either need to adjust the placement of your servo mounts or you need to sand along the widow's peak. Because like we discussed in a previous video, as you start painting this thing, you start building on layers of paint, primer, clear coat, whatnot. The tolerances of this widow's peak start to diminish. And as they diminish, there's more and more friction. The faceplate can't close properly. And I actually had these issues as I was installing the motorization kit in this. So I had to sand these two edges right here of the faceplate. So now it opens just fine and it closes just fine too. So I think we're finally ready to start installing the electronics, testing it out. And once everything is working, we're just gonna super glue everything down. We're gonna plastic weld everything down. That way it can't break. And of course, we're going to be using the PCB I designed for an 80 tiny 85 USB board in the previous electronics video using PCBWay. And of course, a huge thank you to PCBWay for sponsoring this video and for sponsoring the channel. Now, if you don't know it already, PCBWay is the industry leader in high quality PCB manufacturing and 3D printing services. From custom circuit boards to innovative 3D printed prototypes, PCBWay offers unparalleled quality, fast turnaround times, and competitive pricing. If you're interested in designing your very own PCBs, I'll be making a tutorial for that in the near future. And I'll also be leaving a link in the description where you can get $5 off your very first order. Now you might be wondering why I bothered making my very own PCB for this helmet and the answer is quite simple. Basically by designing my own PCB and by ordering it through PCBWay, I'm completely eliminating the need for all this wiring for the connectors to the board. In the simplest terms possible, all this wiring you see here has been designed into the board. So basically this PCB is serving as a breakout board. So all the connectors are linked to the pins on the ATtiny85 board and completely eliminates the need to do all this soldering. I'm gonna need that later. <laughs> and once all the connectors and the board has been soldered to the PCB board, all I need to do is crimp some connectors and plug them into the board. So I have one wire that is for the power. I have another wire that's for the switch. And then I have this one, which is for the eyes. And lastly, I have these two little connectors that lead back to JR connectors. And these are gonna be for the servos. So there are two things we need to test out with the helmet to make sure that everything is working for the motorization. The first one would be finding the closed position of the servo arm. So right now, I have no idea in which position my servos are. So when I turn this on, there's a good chance that my servo arms aren't going to be aligned and they're just gonna be all wonky. So to find the closed position of your servos, we have to unscrew the servo arms from the servos themselves and we have to set all of this up and turn it on as if we were using the helmet. Now, once the eyes light up, that means the faceplate is in its closed position and that means the servos are in their closed position. So once the servos are in their correct position, we can just take the servo arms and screw them back into the servos. And now they're correctly aligned. So just give me a second, I'm gonna do that right now and then we'll move on to step two. Unscrew this one right here. Don't lose the screw. Unplug that. Okay, so now the faceplate has been unscrewed from the servo arms. Now we can attach all of this and turn it on. Plug that in. Now let's see. Oh, geez, Louise, that's bright. Okay, so it just opened. Now it's closed. So I can close this and attach the servos. Now this is either gonna go really, really well or it's gonna go really, really bad. There's no in between. <laughs> okay, so they're both attached. Now let's see what happens if I click the button. Oh God. 
That's terrifying, jeez Louise. So when it opens, you can probably tell it slams into the helmet and then it tilts back forwards. That means we're gonna have to adjust the servo position. And also the speed, you could probably tell that was really, really fast. So for step two of installing the electronics, we're going to want to change some of the code. So just like I explained in the electronics episode, we're going to want to modify the configuration files. So one thing we're gonna wanna change is the servo closing speed, cause right now it's like way too fast. And the other thing we're gonna wanna change is the servo position when it opens. So I'm gonna grab my computer, change the configuration files and re-upload the code. And once you've figured out your ideal closing and opening speed and your ideal servo positions, you should have something that looks a little bit like this. There we go. It doesn't slam into the back of the helmet, which is very nice. And then when it closes fairly fast, but it doesn't slam into the jaw. So I think we're good. I think we're finally ready. I think we're finally ready to install everything. Now, when it comes to installation, this is totally personal preference. I've seen people just hot glue their boards into their helmet, into the suit, whatever. Personally, I really like using 3D printed cases. So with a 3D printed case of your choice, you can put all your electronics in here, including your PCB, maybe a few of the connectors so they don't stick out. And then I like using a little bit of Velcro on the back. That way I can Velcro it into the helmet. And I do the exact same thing for the battery packs too. So this helmet sits pretty low on my head. So with an extra battery pack on the top of my head, it should raise it a little bit and align it with my eyes. And then, and then once all this is figured out, we're just gonna need to glue the button in the ideal position in the jaw and then glue the eyes into the eye slits. And now that everything's been glued in, we're basically done. All we have left is to try it out. So let me remove this, toss this on, and throw the neck seal on. There we go, beautiful. And it works. <laughs> Pretty satisfied with the results. It holds together very, very well. I added some padding in the cheeks and also on the back of the head so it stays aligned and it keeps the button from accidentally triggering. So I'm not constantly closing the faceplate on myself. Voila. And the speed's pretty good too. It goes down rather quickly, but it doesn't slam on my face, which is very, very nice. Yeah. So yeah, that pretty much covers the helmet. So now that this is done, I'm gonna go change into my Tony Stark cosplay and we're gonna try on the boot and the gauntlet with the helmet and we're gonna see how it looks. Whatcha? So this is going to be my Tony Stark cosplay at this year's Fan Expo Canada in a few weeks. So of course I got the gauntlet here. I have a NeoPixel in my hand for the repulsor and I also added some small LEDs underneath this inner detail just to kind of simulate the electronics that would be inside the suit and whatnot. And of course, boot. I don't even think you guys can see it from here. I'm not even sure because I can't see with these glasses. He only wears these for like two seconds in the movie when he's shopping at the hardware store to make, you know, weapons and whatnot. But uh, I thought they were cool. So I got a pair to go with the outfit. My buddy. And I also completely forgot to talk about the rest of the outfit. So of course I got the navy pants, I got the black hoodie, and I got the white t-shirt that says AIM on it for that little bit of authenticity. And of course I made myself an arc reactor using an EL panel underneath a resin print that gives that arc reactor silhouette. So yeah, that pretty much covers everything. I'm gonna throw on the helmet real quick. Looking pretty spiffy if I do say so myself. Sick. And there you have it. <laughs> this looks so cool. I made all this. This is wonderful. Anywho, I really hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments down below. And if you want to see more content on this channel, just like this video, please hit that like and subscribe button. And once again, a huge thank you to PCBWay for sponsoring this channel. And I'll see you guys in the next one.